Hello everyone and welcome to this, the latest episode of Book Time with Elvis with me, Mark. And today I thought I would do something different. I would run down my top 15. I tried to do 10 and I couldn't stop. I could have gone on and on, but I've ended up with 15. My top 15 uh, popular historians. The only real caveat is that they uh, have published their work after... Uh, 1950 uh, because otherwise I could have just gone on and on and on and still I could go on and on um, they do tend as well uh, by sheer accident to all have been British um, <laughs> so I don't know what that says they're not all men though so you know don't uh, don't uh, don't have a go at me for that at least um, and uh, yes I did think about maybe popping some uh, other uh, nationalities in there. Uh, however, I don't think I'm widely read enough on them. The only possible exception um, who is kind of an honorary mention is uh, Robert K. Massey, uh, who wrote um, a series of three books about the, uh, the Romanov dynasty um, from Peter the Great through to Catherine the Great through to the last uh, Romanovs. So I, I think he's a fantastic writer and I really enjoy those books. However, um, I wanted to keep it kind of uniform, so he just gets an honorable mention. There are plenty of American historians that I have read and enjoyed, um, as well as ones from other countries. However, uh, I may have only read one work from that historian, so I didn't include them, whereas the uh, following, 15, I have read mo m not most of their works, but multiple works, and so I feel uh, in a better position to put them in there. So that's kind of qualifying uh, this list a little bit. So let's start off. I'll start off with a, a historian. And by the way, the term historian, it, it applies here in terms of those who just write kind of a historical narrative. Uh, it uh, implies people who are also academics uh, and those who are not academics but write history. So it's a mix. Yeah, it doesn't mean they are necessarily professional historians, but perhaps they are authors who happen to write history. It doesn't mean that they're any less good because they're not uh, academics, uh, but yeah, some of them are, some of them aren't. So let's start off um, with a historian who I think is a little bit fairly, unfairly treated on Goodreads, for example. His books don't tend to rate that highly, but I really like them. And it's an author called John Mann. And John Mann has written a series of books on East Asian, uh, particularly Chinese and Mongolian history. Uh, he wrote this one. I believe it may have been his first, although it could have been Attila the Hun. Um, but uh, yeah, so he's written uh, on the, on the, on the uh, Mongols uh, with, like, for example, this biography of Genghis Khan. Um, he's written about uh, Kublai Khan. And then he's done some interesting books where he's looked at the history surrounding um, certain Chinese artifacts. So for example, he's written one called The Great Wall, uh, The Terracotta Army, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, which of course the Terracotta Army looks at the first uh, first emperor of China uh, and the story surrounding that. What I like about John Mann is that his books tend to be a mixture of uh, the history and um, travel. He gets out in the field and he will, um, you know, visit the places that he talks about, and he will uh, talk about what he sees now. For example, in the in the Great Wall one, um, he traces uh, pretty much the um, the Great Wall, and he goes even into different parts of uh, Mongolia looking for uh, remnants of it. And I like that, and I think he's uh, good fun uh, and easy to read. So I would definitely recommend uh, John Mann. I don't unfortunately have books for everybody, um, so I'll have to stick up uh, maybe some pictures. The next on my list is uh, Christopher Hibbert. I really like uh, Christopher Hibbert, sadly no longer uh, with us. He wrote a fantastic book on the uh, Medici family, which I would very much recommend, uh, as well as a really good book on the French Revolution. Uh, he has a really big bibliography and has written a lot. Of history books and the ones I've uh, read I've enjoyed all of them so I would definitely recommend him 
Next up, we have uh, slightly uh, younger uh, than the other two, and alive, of course, in the case of Christopher Hibbert. Uh, we have uh, Simon Sebag Montefiore, and he's written some really interesting books uh, recently on Russia. This is one of them, uh, Stalin and the Court of the Red Tsar, and it looks at day-to-day -day life of the regime that Stalin headed up and the inner circle uh, of uh, Stalin's inner circle uh, during his reign. And it is, again, very interesting, uh, all the material that he includes in that. He's also written a book about um, Catherine the Great and Potemkin, as well as a one-volume history of the Romanovs. Uh, he has written other books as well, but it's the Russian books that I came to him uh, for and that I am very interested in. Um, he did write as well a very good um, biography of Jerusalem, which is also well worth uh, checking out. Next up we have Andrew Roberts, and Andrew Roberts is a bit of a controversial figure owing to him being seen as quite a, a conservative uh, politician, and he has on occasion perhaps been seen to defend some things that we would consider to be indefensible. However, he is a very good writer, and I think uh, a very good historian. He's written uh, an excellent uh, volume on the Second World War, the Storm of War, uh, as well as a, a Churchill biography. Uh, my favorite book that I read of his, I read last year, uh, and it's Napoleon, or in America I believe it's called Napoleon the Great, and it is a big, chunky uh, biography of uh, the man himself, and it is well worth uh, reading. If you don't fancy taking on the chunk, then uh, I can also recommend uh, the audiobook, which is very good uh, indeed. Next up, actually I'll skip through a little bit because I think it's good to stick with something similar. So following on from Napoleon and Andrew Roberts, I'll go with the, uh, unfortunately again, sadly passed away, uh, Richard Holmes. Now, there are two Richard Holmes uh, historians. Um, there is a Richard Holmes who has written a lot on uh, the Enlightenment and Romanticism, and he's done a fantastic uh, biography of um, Shelley, Percy Shelley. Uh, that's not that Richard Holmes. This Richard Holmes is a military historian, and he has written, or he wrote rather, for example, this biography of Wellington, as well as uh, books about um, the British soldier. There's uh, Redcoat, Tommy, Saib, uh, about the British in India and whatnot. But this is a fantastic uh, biography of the Iron Duke, the Duke of Wellington. And I was very lucky to meet uh, Richard Holmes uh, not too long before he passed away. Um, and uh, the book was given to me by a friend for my birthday, my 22nd birthday, and uh, they wrote in it. Uh, and it was, uh, I think it was the same day, uh, he took me to a um, presentation given by Richard Holmes in the local Waterstones, and we met him, and he was able to write in there as well to mark with best wishes uh, Richard Holmes, and he was really nice, a really nice man, and he uh, had some wonderful television shows as well. Um, he was very interesting, very easy to listen to. It was very sad that he passed away far too young. Um, so next up we have um, a man who just qualifies and it's Sir Stephen Runciman. Uh, you may know him, you may not know him, he's not going to be particularly popular these days. Uh, he published a fantastic three volume work on the Crusades, First Crusade, Second Crusade, Third Crusade, um, and he did so from 1951, so he just sneaks in. Um, I picked up his book, The First Crusade, by accident, um, as, in, as in I just picked it up thinking it was something else, didn't look at it. Uh, from home, I already had it, uh, and I was going somewhere, and I had no choice then but to read it, and as I read it, I found it extremely readable, and then when I got home, I continued to read the others. Uh, so yeah, Stephen Runciman, he um, was born in the early part of the 20th century, and he died uh, quite old, actually. Um, I'm not sure exactly how old he was. I could have looked it up, I suppose, but it's not really relevant to this video. Uh, but I would recommend, for sure, if you're interested in the Crusades, to read his three-volume work on the Crusades. Uh, next up, we have uh, Roger Crowley, who's a historian I came to fairly recently. Um, he wrote uh, really uh, 
interesting book on uh, the Ottomans um, and their uh, taking over of um, uh, the south eastern part of uh, Europe and particularly how um, how it related to the Christian powers that were there. Uh, it was called Empires of the Sea and it looked at the uh, kind of compared uh, the Habsburg forces, uh, sea forces with those of uh, Ottoman uh, Turkey and it's again a really good read. He writes it like a kind of swashbuckling novel uh, and again it's, it's just populated with great characters uh, and it's really well worth uh, your time as also his book uh, 1453 uh, The Holy War for Christendom and the Fall of Constantinople uh, again he brings um, that terrible period uh, where Constantinople found itself uh, in absolutely dire straits being besieged by the Ottoman Turks. He brings that so to life and he gives different stories of the um, people involved in the defense as well as the offense against uh, the city. But it's, 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 it's an excellent read and I really recommend you checking out Roger Crowley. He has a couple of other books out at the moment, uh, Conquerors, uh, about how Portugal uh, built their global empire as well as um, City of Fortune, uh, which is how Venice uh, won their empire. And there's one called The Accursed Tower, which is about um, the last battle for the Holy Land and the fall and siege of Accra. Um, I need to read those three. I haven't done so yet. Uh, I do have them. I did start uh, The Accursed Tower, an audiobook, and it was great. Uh, the only reason I didn't finish it was because I kept falling asleep and missing parts. So the parts I listened to are absolutely fantastic, uh, but I need to actually go back and concentrate on uh, reading it. Next up, we have uh, Lynn MacDonald. Now, unfortunately, I have only one of her books here, and it's not in the be best condition. Uh, the book I've got is, they called it Passchendaele, and it's the 1917 book uh, in her books about the First World War. She wrote um, books for each year of the First World War, so 1914, 1915, 1916, 1917, and 1918. So she wrote those five books. Each one has its own title, but also, um, although this one doesn't, uh, would have the, the year that it's uh, set in. And um, they were published uh, quite a long time ago. I mean, I read, read them uh, at least over 20 years ago. Now you might be thinking, oh, they're probably outdated. Well, I don't agree that they are because um, Lynn MacDonald, what she does is, I think, really special. She spent a lot of time researching and interviewing survivors on all sides of the First World War. I think it took her 20 years, even before she was able to write it, to try and track down as many survivors as she could and record their stories before... Um, before they passed away forever and before the stories were lost forever. And what she does is when she writes, she writes the history of the First World War, but she intersperses it seamlessly with first-hand accounts and testimony, and it's fascinating. I really recommend um, those. You could probably really start with any of them, but I would suggest starting with uh, 1914 A New Hope. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, she does some really... It's, I mean, they're very moving stories in there. I remember the, the, the opening part of 1915 um, is, um, are a load of uh, letters to the Times newspaper in London, and they're all from bereaved parents of officers who are you know, looking for their uh, son's swords and things to be returned to them, as it's like the only memory they have of them and things like that. But it's really amazing, and she, re and, and she does take it from both sides, so she'll speak to Germans as well as... Um, Englishman and others. So, yeah, I would definitely recommend Ling McDonald's uh, First World War books. Next up, we have a real favourite of mine. Um, I mean, they're all, of course, favourites, uh, but uh, I really like uh, the following gentleman. And again, he sadly passed away uh, not too long ago, and it's Lord Norwich, Viscount Norwich, John Julius Norwich. Unfortunately, I don't have um, the best of his books with me. This is a really good book, but it, it wouldn't necessarily be the one I recommend you to start with. Um, it's Shakespeare's Kings. He, in this one, he looks at uh, the kings from Shakespeare's history plays, so Richard II uh, through to 
uh, Henry the Sixth. I think it actually might go through to Henry the Eighth. Um, but uh, yeah, it certainly goes through the Wars of the Roses anyway. And he looks at the lives and also how they're portrayed within uh, Shakespeare and what Shakespeare says about them, as well as the true history behind them. But the best uh, books for um, him, if you're going to check them out, are his. Um, well, you can get his short history of Byzantium. It's a single volume work, but I would recommend going for his three volume history of Byzantium, um, which is the. Um, oh, I can't remember. The Rise, yeah. The Rise is the first one, the Apogee, and then uh, the Fall or Decline and Fall. Uh, and it's an amazing epic. And it reads like, again, some kind of historical fiction. Uh, fantastic. Uh, narrative so much information it's a, really is a sweeping epic and uh, you know I was moved to tears by the end of it I have to say it was really brilliantly done uh, but you can also check out his, his uh, one volume history of France which is excellent his one volume history of the Mediterranean he's done a history of the papacy and the popes which is also very good to be honest I would recommend anything by John Julius Norwich you, ca you can't go wrong with him uh, next up we have um, Alex von Tonzelman, and she's a new, newish, new historian, a quite recent one, and someone I've come to very recently. I've read three of her works so far, and I thoroughly enjoyed all of them. Uh, there was Indian Summer, which was a kind of trio. I don't want to say dual. What do you say instead of dual for three? I don't know. Te tetra tetralogical biography. She did a a book about the last days of empire within uh, India. And um, Indian Summer, Indian Summers, Indian Summer, uh, and it was kind of a biography, if you like, of uh, Lord Mountbatten, Mohandas K. Gandhi, and uh, Nehru. Um, and it was fascinating, really fascinating, superbly written. She is a really excellent writer. She also wrote a book called Real History, where she looks at how history is depicted in films. So it's real, like fil film real. Uh, and again, uh, you know, how Hollywood and other filmmakers, uh, you know, either sex up history, uh, you know, for, for obtaining viewers where it can be a lot of nonsense, or uh, maybe they miss some good stuff as well. So uh, that's, that's also a very good one. And then recently, her new book, I think, is up for an award, um, a nonfiction award, which is Fallen Idols where she uh, took as her starting point the uh, destatuing of uh, controversial statues, for example, Edward Colston in um, Bristol in the United Kingdom, as well as various uh, Civil War generals. And she looks at the history of this, of ta tearing down statues, and she takes um, several examples from around the world. And it was an excellent book. I thoroughly, uh, heartily recommend it. Uh, next up is another favorite of mine. I think she's a wonderful lady. Uh, you should certainly watch her programs if you get a chance, and I think a few of them are available on YouTube, and it's Mary Beard, the classicist. Uh, she wrote a wonderful book called SBQR on the history of uh, Rome, history of ancient Rome. Uh, we read it last year as a group read. It was the first time I'd read this particular one, but I adore her other works like um, uh, History of Pompeii. Uh, she wrote a nice one on the... Um, uh, oh, tongue-in-cheek one. About how to how to manage your slave or something like that from a Roman point of view, and she looks very much into the ordinary lives of ordinary Romans, and uh, tries to tell their story as well. And and and, and she's fascinating. She's very uh, eccentric, but very uh, very wonderful classicist and historian that I heartily recommend to you. Next up are two more that I sadly don't have uh, with me. Uh, one is uh, Robert Hutchinson, and he wrote... Um, I think he, he's still alive, so he might still be writing, but I haven't read anything from him recently. Uh, books primarily dealing with the Tudors. Uh, he wrote a great book called The Last Days of Henry VIII, which I can't recommend enough, as well as one called The House of Treason, which was a look at the um, House of Howard, um, so the um, uh, Duke of Norfolk uh, in the Tudor times and his family uh, because you know, several of them either found themselves uh, in the tower, on the scaffold and that kind of thing and he also wrote I think a really good 
uh, biography of Thomas Cromwell. I, I really enjoyed it. However, it was published a year before uh, Hilary Mantel came out with Wolf Hall. Now, I haven't read Wolf Hall, um, although when I look at the reviews, a lot of people, uh, I think a little bit unfairly malign uh, Hutchinson's book about uh, Thomas Cromwell because uh, they say he shows his dislike for Cromwell. Well, um, I, don't, I didn't get that. I mean, I, I came away feeling pretty sorry for Cromwell uh, by the end. But I know Wolf Hall has kind of pushed, uh, maybe to some degree unrealistically, um, you know, Cromwell's character. Um, you know, he, he, he's, a, he's a difficult person. And um, he's not necessarily a sympathetic person, in, I think, in reality. Now, Hilary Mantel probably makes him so. And I think um, Hutchinson suffered a bit from that, perhaps, when uh, a year later, you know, people went looking for other books to read about it, and there weren't a huge number of them around at the time. And uh, they then said, oh, you know, he's not very sympathetic to, to Cromwell. Well, I think that was kind of a normal attitude at the time it was uh, published, anyway. That's my opinion. And uh, almost there, next up, we have Ian Mortimer. You probably know him because he, he wrote this wonderful Time Traveller series, uh, time Traveller in Medieval England, Time tra Traveller in Elizabethan England, uh, Time Traveller in Restoration England, uh, where he looks again at how you would survive if you had to go back in time. Uh, but he also wrote um, a biography of uh, his namesake, Sir Roger Mortimer, who um, seized power from Edward II, along with uh, Edward II's estranged wife, and as well as biographies of uh, kings uh, Edward III, Henry IV, Henry V, uh, among others, and uh, he's very, very readable, very, very interesting, and again, I, I really recommend him. I can't recommend all of these enough. And we come to another big favourite of mine who I've mentioned on here uh, a lot, and that's the, um, the writer slash historian uh, Giles Milton. I've shown this book on here before because it's one of the few I've got actually in a uh, physical copy. Uh, but Giles Milton has written wonderful books across a range of different subjects. So you have, for example, uh, Elizabethan exploration of the new world in this book. He wrote a fantastic book called Samurai William, which looked at the first uh, English and Dutch uh, and Europeans, really, uh, that went to Japan. He wrote a, bi a really great biography of his uh, father-in-law called uh, Wolfram, A Boy at War, uh, about his uh, father-in-law who had to... Um, uh, you know, join join the, uh, the I can't remember now if it was just the Hitler Youth and then the army. I think it was in the, certainly in the last days of the war. But it was very interesting because it was uh, his, his father-in-law, by the way, isn't just some unknown person. He he is quite a well-known artist, um, and he wrote a uh, great book, Churchill's um, oh, what do you call it? Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, uh, which looked at uh, all the different. Um, things people did to try and come up with uh, uh, winning the war. Um, there was also, oh, I've got some, Nathaniel's Nutmeg, the history of the spice trade, which was excellent as well. Um, his latest one is um, Checkmate in Berlin, which is about the early days of the occupation of Berlin, which is excellent, really well worth checking out. Everything, again, by him is superb, and, I, and it's such a variety. I'm sure you'll find something to interest you there. And then last up, we have another great uh, historian, uh, military historian and, and journalist, and that's Sir Max Hastings here. Uh, the only book I've got of his available uh, in physical copy is All Hell Let Loose, a single volume of the Second World War. He wrote a great book called Catastrophe, which is a single volume of the First World War. Uh, he's also written on many, many uh, wars. He's written a great book on the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Falklands War, so on and so forth. Uh, he is eminently readable, enjoyable, extremely knowledgeable, well-researched, and he just spins a good yarn, and what more can you want? I mean, his books gen ten tend to be rather huge, uh, but uh, you don't really notice it. You know, I, I, I certainly uh, think uh, he is well worth you checking out if you haven't come into contact with Max Hastings before, or indeed any of these wonderful uh, historian, writers, academics, etc. Um, so yeah, there we go. Uh, 
was quite a long video. I was hoping it would be a bit shorter, but you know, I do have a propensity to wrap it on as I'm doing right now. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for watching. Do take care, everybody. See you next time. Bye for now. Better, 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 better